thank you all for coming out on short notice to this Playbook Cocktails. Uh, this is a pop-up version of Playbook Cocktails. I thank uh, our colleagues here at the museum, all the Politico events uh, folks, the staff of uh, Senator Booker and Senator Paul for making this possible on short notice. I called Alexis Williams, Politico's director of events, over the 4th of July weekend and I said, this may be a crazy idea, but what if and she said, let's do it. So thank you all uh, for being here. Uh, before we kick this off, I'd like to thank Bank of America for making these conversations possible. Uh, these playbook events are a great partnership, a forum where we get to discuss the most important issues facing Washington and the country as we're going to do today. So thank you to our friends at Bank of America. Uh, those of you who are watching on the live stream, welcome. And if you have a great question, please tweet it to me. I've, I'll get it here on my Twitter machine, uh, hashtag Playbook Cocktails. And so without further ado, for their first joint public appearance ever, uh, we have Senator Rand Paul and Senator Cory Booker. Welcome. <laughs> Senator Booker, welcome. Thank, thank you for coming. You. Senator Paul, thank, thank you for you. coming. Uh, thank you very much uh, for coming out. The, uh, the Senate's new odd couple, Huffington Post says uh, this is a, Huffington Post says this is a bromance. <laughs> I'm worried who's Felix and who's Oscar in that. <laughs> I'm just wondering if we can get a reality show and whether ethics will allow us to collect you know, any compensation for that. <laughs> <laughs> We're both a little camera shy now. So, uh, Senator Paul, this week you uh, both uh, introduced the Redeem. Act. This is, as I understand it, just to spell it out, the REDEEM Act, uh, which is the record expungement designed to enhance employment. And the way I understand that is if you were a young person who got caught with pot brownies, you don't want to make it so you can never get a job. Yeah, you know, what I've found as I've been around uh, Kentucky and met people is that I meet people who have trouble still getting a job because of their felony record sometimes. And many of these are nonviolent felonies. And I think really, you serve your time, you should get a second chance. And so to me, it's a lot about trying to get people back into society, back into employment. And I think uh, this is uh, great. It's been, Corey and I both have had great ideas for it. And I think the bill's turned out, I think it'll be a, a good success if we can get it through. And Senator Paul, yesterday you talked to President Obama about the REDEEM Act. How did that go? He's interested, and uh, I've also uh, met with uh, Eric Holder as well on these issues. And uh, frankly, I complimented him on some of the pardons that he's done for people who have been in jail 10, 15, 20 years for crack cocaine, whereas if it had been powder cocaine, they'd have, they've neither never went to jail or went to jail for six months or a year. And really, there still is some disparity there. And I think he's aware of it. But I complimented him on that, because I think a lot of times we Republicans aren't complimenting the president very often. And so when I can, <laughs> I, I try to. And it is an issue where I think both parties can come together and work on an issue. Senator uh, Cory Booker, would you say that the current drug laws are racist or just incoherent? Well, <laughs> a little bit. Senator Paul says a little bit. Barack Obama, great president or greatest president? <laughs> um, look, look um, we, we have a, a, a serious, serious crisis in this country that we are only 4 to 5 percent of the globe's population, but we incarcerate 25 percent of the globe's uh, prison population. And it'd be one thing if there were all people going out there with violent crimes and, and, and sticking people up, but 72 percent about of those people are nonviolent criminals. And we've had an explosion of the prison population since the so-called war on drugs started. But since uh, about the 70s, you've seen, in fact, there are more people today in jail for nonviolent drug offenses than all the people in prison in 1975. And so we have a, a serious problem that's costing taxpayers billions, and in fact, a quarter of a trillion dollars a year we're grossly spending to take away people's liberty, that ultimately what we could be doing is empowering them to be successful. So look, you know, I, I, I just got to the Senate uh, in October, and people like uh, Senator R uh, Rand Paul, uh, Senator Mike Lee, Senator Leahy, Senator Durbin, a lot of folks were already starting to stay uh, in, a, in, in a growing bipartisan chorus. Enough is enough. We could be saving money, empowering people to succeed, and ending something that really betrays American values, fiscal prudency and liberty. Senator Paul, did President Obama commit to push for this? Did he commit to pushing Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid to take it up? 
um, I don't know if I want to go that far. He's, a, he's supportive of the concept. I think I can say that. And I think he will help. He indicated that he, he wanted to bring some of the sponsors of these bills to the White House to talk more about them. But publicly, I think he's been very supportive of criminal justice reform. And I think you have people on both sides of the aisle. Uh, Corey mentioned uh, Senator Lee as well from Utah, who's been doing this. So he and Durbin have a bill on mandatory minimums, where sometimes you commit a crime and the judge has no discretion. And often these federal judges are writing opinions saying, I'm horrified by putting this young man in prison for 10 years or 15 years, sometimes 55 years for sale of marijuana. And I, I sort of halfway jokingly say in Kentucky, you can kill somebody and be eligible for parole in 12 years, but you could sell marijuana and go to jail for 50 years. So we, we really have to fix this problem. And so the thing is, there's no, the, the states really are laboratories of innovation. And you're seeing these red states uh, get rid of mandatory minimums, mm -hmm. doing other things. In fact, 29 states have been able to reduce their prison populations, and in 26 of them, crime has actually gone down. So now it's no longer this juxtaposition between tough on crime and public safety. You actually can be tough on crime, uh, and you can actually lower recidivism rates if you do the common sense things that, that exist in the Redeem Act. Senator Paul, you said when I asked earlier if the drug laws were uh, racist or just incoherent, you said a little of both. In what sense are they racist? Well, I think they're inadvertently racial or they have a racial outcome. Three out of four people in prison are black or brown. But if you look at statistics on who uses drugs, white kids are using drugs at the same rate as black kids and, white, and brown kids, and white kids are 80% of the public. And three out of four people in prison are black or brown. So it's that it's easier to arrest poor kids. It, poor kids don't get as good a representation. And then they get, after every step, they get arrested more often, but their plea bargains work out less well for them. But it, it, is ha it does have a racial outcome. It's, I don't think it's uh, done with purpose, but it is, that is the result, and it's hard to escape the facts. Yeah, and if you just look at the data, an African-American who uses uh, marijuana versus a white person marijuana, no difference in, in using rates, but you're 3.7 times more likely to be arrested if you're African-American. Uh, African-Americans are 20% uh, uh, more likely to get that mandatory minimum than if that person, uh, than somebody's white. So that you have, basically what I say is a, a preponderance of the reasons to, to do something different uh, from disparate racial and, and economic impact, from gross waste of taxpayer dollars, to the undermining of human potential. I don't think Americans have a higher proclivity to crime than other countries, so why are we locking more of us up when you can do just common sense things? Let me give you an example of something in this bill that most people don't actually think about. When your job does FBI background checks, there's 17 million background checks last year alone. Studies are showing upwards of 50%, half of them are inaccurate or incomplete. And so somebody that actually didn't have a conviction, maybe just had an arrest and all charges were cleared, it's showing up to their work that, that, that they had a conviction and people aren't hiring them. So just taking away common sense things actually could help to empower people to succeed as opposed to what happens now is once that young 18-year-old uh, has a criminal conviction for, for doing something the last three presidents admitted to doing, that now you have that kid who's got a felony conviction that prevents them from getting uh, food stamps, prevents them from getting Pell Grants, prevents them from living in public housing, prevents them from doing a lot of those safety net things that help propel people up the economic ladder uh, to get a job. And when they apply for a job and they have to check that box just for smoking marijuana, uh, uh, they won't get that job. It doesn't go like that when you run for president, I hear, that you don't have to check that box. Um, <laughs> Uh, so at this first standing room only playbook cocktails here on the stage, we have a conservative Republican, a progressive Democrat. Senator Booker. Did they offer you cocktails? <laughs> I <laughs> seen cocktails, but I didn't get all of them. We won't tell this, what's in it. Just pass uh, it on uh, 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 Cheers. <laughs> uh, Senator Booker, take us behind the scenes. How did this bromance happen I understand that I understand that like a lot of people you courted on the internet and you were brought together in part by Seinfeld um, well I, I do have to say that I am a long since uh, rec recognized the great American holiday of Festivus and, uh, and, and uh, I, I, I happened to uh, see that uh, Rand Paul was uh, listing his grievances uh, which is one of the elements of Festivus and you have a long list of grievances sir we did, yes yes, yes. And, and, one of them was that I did not tweet him enough. Uh, uh, and Wait, so, I can't believe you didn't tweet anybody enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is hard to believe, Corey. Um, yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> he certainly didn't complain that you didn't Instagram enough. No, no. But, uh, but, but look, the, the, in my election, I talked about, uh, to get down here, I actually brought up Rand Paul often when people talked about the problems of Washington. I said, look, there's so much, many areas on tough problems 
where we can find things to work on. I would bring him up as somebody that I have a lot of agreement in the space of criminal justice reform. I was sworn in on Halloween, that other auspicious holiday like Festivus, and uh, uh, one of the first people to come over to me and, and congratulate me uh, was Rand Paul, and that was, I think, the first time we mentioned uh, uh, the issue. And again, as I said, he and others had already been working on the issue. I asked if we could do some things together. But I just remembered the first time I really met you, you were tweeting, and it was in the green room of like uh, NBC in oh, New York, yeah. and couldn't get a word in edgewise because he was busy tweeting somebody. <laughs> that was nice. so. I was, hey, check it out. I'm in the green room with Rand Paul. <laughs> <laughs> so we were sitting across tweeting back yeah, at so him. Sure. And, uh, yeah. So some breaking news just while we've been here. In the studio, uh, waiting the president at 6:45 tonight is beginning to be giving a statement on the humanitarian crisis on the border. Senator Paul, how is this crisis going to end? You know, I think it illustrates why, and I'm for immigration reform. I'm for some form of immigration reform, but if you do the forgiveness aspect or the beacon aspect of it before you secure the border, this is what happens. There are and ads, and, and there, you believe that's what happened. Well, see, what's going on is there are ads running throughout Central America saying you need to come before August 14th. The president will let you in and you can stay before August 14th. And I don't know where this is coming from, but this is, these are flyers being handed out throughout Central America. So people are flooding to the border and it is a humanitarian nightmare. But we can't have a beacon without a secure border. And this is important because if we ever want to get immigration reform done, there will be some sort of form of forgiveness for those who want to work or for those who are children that were brought here. There are Republicans like myself who are for some form of forgiveness, but you can't do it if you have a completely open border because then everybody will come. And that's what's going on, I think. Senator Paul, do you believe the administration through its actions, lack of actions, words, do you think it was complicit in sending that message, sending that idea? I don't know how the idea got started, but there has been a rumor and discussion for the last couple of months that if there is no immigration reform by August 1st, that the administration will act unilaterally. If they do this unilaterally, if they go ahead and just sort of say, we're going to forgive people unilaterally, we're no longer going to prosecute anyone for breaking the law, I think that then immigration reform is done. Because if we're not going to do it legally and not going to work out a compromise, I think there's a real problem uh, if he does it unilaterally. And I am for some form of immigration reform, but it has to be Republicans and Democrats figuring out a middle ground. But I guess what I'm asking is, is what's going on now at the border partly the administration's fault? I think all of the last uh, I think you've asked that question for the last for three times. And I think the point is, uh, we're all, well, well, let Senator Paul finish and then I'll Well, what I would say so is, you're, you're treating me like a junior senator. Right? <laughs> I don't, <understand> <laughs> um, one actually, I don't have that. a good answer. You go first. Well, I, 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 yeah. I, I think that this is, uh, let's break some news right now that Rand Paul and, and the president agree on this. The president has gone on record saying the same thing that I heard uh, Rand just say, which is we need comprehensive immigration reform. And it happened in the Senate that we actually hammered out. <laughs> <laughs> hammered out. They're, they're in the Senate, before I got here, they hammered out uh, a bipartisan immigration reform proposal that was done, finished, and something that the president has uh, spoken well of. Right now it's stuck that we can't even get a vote on it in the House of Representatives. That's problematic. But, but the problem I had with the immigration reform is it did not have border security preceding the forgiveness aspect. And that's why I've been big on, and conservatives who are for immigration reform are big on, there has to be an order to the way things happen. So the border needs to be secured. And then I want Congress to vote every year, is the border secure or not secure, and then gradually begin giving work visas to those who are already here. It's not quite what the Senate bill was, and I think on, the only way you can convince the American public that border security will happen, particularly like right now it doesn't look like it is happening, the only way you can convince people that it will happen is maybe not just this president, but any president shouldn't have all the power to secure the border. Maybe Congress should retain that power to see that the border is secured. Uh, Senator Booker, the president's in Texas raising money. Should he go to the border? Uh, you know, again, the, the, the crux of this and these things uh, I don't want to opine on, the crux of this is, is, is very obvious to me, is first of all, this, the, the, the Senate bill, I agree with you, there's not everything in it that I would want in it. But we have to have compromise. And when I watched uh, Republicans and Democrats who didn't get all that what they wanted, but pass a bipartisan bill, uh, that was encouraging. And so who, who goes to the border, look, the tr fact is the Congress has to do their job. And so in the Senate, I saw it happen. Everybody didn't get what they wanted, but we got something done. So, and so me, the real me. issue should be, the question shouldn't be, what's the president doing today, what's the president's not doing today? The, the spotlight 
should be on Boehner, and why isn't he bringing something to a vote? Maybe even reflects Rand's bill. Let the House do something different, but bring this issue. We have an urgency, not only on our borders, but you, we all know this. The majority of illegal immigration actually is not happening uh, anymore on our borders. They're coming in in a whole bunch of different ways right. when it comes to... But, uh, to but, it, but it also illustrates one of the problems when people say, oh, the, we're going to secure the border. One of the problems with the kids down there is we all have sympathy for them. It's a, it's, it's a humanitarian nightmare. However, what we're doing is they're caught breaking the law, they get a summons and a ticket, and they're told to come back in a month. They're gone to the interior of the country and they don't come back. This is part of the problem of overall the por porosity of the border is we give people a ticket and say come back in a month and people don't come back in a month. And so we don't really have an enforcement mechanism to secure our border and we have an enormous safety net slash welfare state in our country. We can't do it for the people we've got here. Okay. We're a trillion dollars short paying for what we have. And allow me just again to say I I'm not going to defend nobody including the president is satisfied with the status quo. But we have to, in, in the government, do some action. And this is why, frankly, I'm proud to sit next to Rand Paul right now, because he and I don't agree on everything. I could write a dissertation on our disagreements. <laughs> but, but the reality no, is, we, we found, we, we, found we, we sat down and said, what can we agree on? Let's put it in a bill, uh, and let's fight for it and push it forward. And it addresses some of the most urgent issues. Everybody in America right knows, and I've seen this, because I'm in cycle right now, you poll people, they're concerned about their financial security. Well, you know what? This bill wants to address the grievous waste of tra taxpayer dollars and the disempowerment of people's economic viability. If we can find things to agree on, we just have to begin to work a lot harder, not to stake out our positions, because in, even in, the, in this bill, there's not everything that I'm sure he would want, not everything I would want, but we've got to start doing the difficult things to reach out to each other and make Congress work for the American people. But on that line, to get us to get to an agreement, so let's say you and I have 100 issues. We probably only agree on 15. That's one we're working on, we really agree on. But maybe 15 issues. But what happens in Congress is we try to fashion a deal and get 60% and say, oh, let's do it, and we trade and trade. We never get there to these big deals. Immigration had so many moving pieces. If we would narrow the focus and do several individual bills that were a more narrow focus, like, for example, extending the STEM visas for uh, science and technology and math majors, there's a 90% agreement on both sides of the aisle in both houses on that. In fact, I tried to pass it last year through unanimous consent. And um, the Democrats objected, put theirs forward, and then the Republicans objected. I was, I was sort of inclined to say, oh, you know what, let's just pass theirs. Let's trick them and not object to their unanimous consent. <laughs> okay. Last, but, last question on this. Senator Booker, forget this trip, forget today. Do you hope that the president will go to the border soon? Uh, again, you, uh, well, would you, would you? This, this is a this is a uh, a relentless effort uh, on your part that I respect, that I admire, indefatigable determination. Um, uh, but uh, I am sitting here right now to, to to reiterate something that I feel incredibly passionate about: Chicago, uh, uh, Camden. Uh, there's too much violence in our communities right now, and I'm telling you right now that if you look at uh, uh, the empowerment of Americans so that we can begin to make our communities safer. It starts with, are you giving people a fair shot to, 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 to do well? And we have thousands of Americans right now being denied opportunities to work because they're checking a box because they, they got caught for smoking pot. They got caught for possession of drugs. Nonviolent offenses. And what I want to do is stop that cycle that's undermining our financial security as a nation, stealing the liberty, undermining the liberty of millions of people. And, and the fact that you have two people of such difference sitting here today to talk about a problem that is not popular. If, if Rand, if you and I polled this issue, would this be a big issue? For, no. Well, no, I think it's growing, though. I think the public that, well, has changed its, its attitude if we can on get things. the press yeah. to focus on this as opposed to what, as opposed to what the president well, did Well, you know what the next went. question should be? Will you, Senator, Bo <laughs> Senator Booker, will you go to the border and talk about criminal justice reform? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Senator Paul, you've done a lot of minority outreach. You've been very intentional about it. In June, you went to Louisville's West End, opened a Republican Party headquarters there. In July, you'll be speaking to the Urban League's National Conference. How did the Republican Party get in such a deep hole with minorities? And it's not just African Americans, not just Hispanics. Mitt Romney lost Asians by more than he lost Hispanics. I don't know how it got so bad. Um, I'm a great uh, fan of history, and when you look back in history, every bad thing happened the Democrat Party did in race relations. I swear, everything happened all the way, you know, till the, all the way through the 60s, everything bad. And then 
really... Wait, Senator Booker, are you going to take that? Well, I mean, <laughs> if the, in my state, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, all opposed by the Democrat legislature, the Jim Crow laws came in with Woodrow Wilson in the federal legislature, came in with uh, the Democrats in Kentucky. Now, things have changed, and that's what people say. You're living in the past. The parties have changed. But what I would say is there, are, there is no reason why Republicans shouldn't try to recapture and reiterate and renew their support for civil rights, minority rights, voting rights, restoring voting rights. So I am working hard on those. And these are issues that are also, they're interesting because to me they're also libertarian-ish kind of issues. But I don't think anyone's ever sort of said, you know what? These issues would apply and even be uh, more important for people who have been persecuted over time. Rebuttal? No rebuttal. Look, I, I haven't, maybe I haven't been down here long enough to get into the zero-sum game binary world of D.C. politics. But frankly, I don't give a damn right now about whether Lincoln was a Republican or a Democrat. He helped to liberate African Americans and bring justice to our country. I, I, I'm not, I'm not I care if Eisenhower was a Republican or a Democrat. He helped to build one of the best infrastructures uh, in the globe at the time. Why don't we stop talking about party and start talking about the real issues that we have too much poverty in this country. And, uh, yeah. Too much incarceration and those kind of things. And my first fundraiser in Washington, D.C., I was running for mayor. First fundraiser in Washington, D.C. was done with two people passionately concerned about African Americans. Passionately concerned. One was named Bill Bradley, one was named Jack Kemp. And Jack Kemp was a dear friend of mine, put in legislation like, like uh, 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 to, to help inter drive economic development using free market ideals into industry communities that many mayors like myself, when I was mayor, took a great advantage of. So it, at some point, this game of ping pong back and forth, who's up, who's down, has got to stop. And we've got to get talking about, are we going to lead this globe again in what matters? Our social mobility in America, measurable indice, has fallen dramatically in the last 20 years. It's better to be born poor in England or Canada in terms of your ability to make it to the middle class. Well, you know what? These are uh, things that have it, may to be, it may be another issue we could work together on because I've taken Jack Kemp's enterprise zones and we have something new we call economic freedom zones. Hold on, and I got to tweet this out uh, while you say that. <laughs> Particularly if you're going to co sponsor it. Tweet, tweet it out if you're going to co sponsor it. Playbook cocktails. Yeah. <laughs> now, this would dramatically lower taxes in areas of high unemployment. So for Detroit, it would be a $1.3 billion stimulus, not from money we take from New Jersey or Kentucky, but simply from money we leave in Detroit that's earned there. There's incentives for hiring people who live in the community of high unemployment. It's a, I tell people it's Jack Kemp's Enterprise Zones on steroids. And uh, we'd love for you to look well, at it. Um, um, the headline tomorrow is that uh, Rand Paul condones steroid use. Um, <laughs> Um, uh, I, we, our staffs are now going to definitely talk about this because we've been working on some legislation as well to do uh, enterprise zones in a modern way, giving more flexibility to localities and keeping more of the resources. Right. And there uh, were some problems originally. The enterprise at, zones at, didn't work as well as people in, wanted them to have worked. In some places. In some places they worked right. well. In some places they definitely need improvement. And that's the thing. We can learn from, and by the way, I, I, I believe the power in the power of the free market to drive uh, resources if it's done uh, uh, in an enlightened and intelligent way. You can actually take areas like Detroit and make them very, very successful. So I'd love to discuss that. Maybe you could become a Republican. You said <laughs> free market? And Senator, I like, I like that. You know, I like the, the, there's that. A, there is a, a, a profound tradition in the American community, a profound tradition in, 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 in the African American community of entrepreneurship. I've gone all over the state of New Jersey trying to talk about technology and its ability to empower the free market. You can disintermediate banks now by Kiva loans, by Kickstarter. There's a, there is a new nonpartisan entrepreneurialism spirit that's sweeping our country where the private sector is getting it and you see companies, uh, and I know this is controversial in DC, but companies like Lyft and Uber who are using technology to do incredibly new ways to help people access their economic ability. Sama Source is one of my favorite companies that's helping to uh, bring jobs and work and economic opportunity to people. So what I'm saying is that, that I love millennials. They're less partisan in their, uh, in, in their, in their affiliation. They're less a partisan in their affiliation. And they're more pragmatic. I have a saying in my politics, which is, uh, in God we trust, I'm a person of faith, but everybody else bring me data. 
and we should be led <laughs> and, and driven by what the data says. And, and no side has a monopoly on good ideas. There'll be areas we disagree on, on raising the minimum wage or, or, or on uh, uh, access to, to birth control and things like that, but there is a lot of space in, in the Senate from talking to people on both sides of the aisle for us to begin to get back to the business that America sent us down to. And fundamental to that is this idea of e pluribus unum, is that we've got to figure out ways to come together uh, as, as, as one. I do want to go on record as being for birth control. All right. Yeah. All right. See you, Booker. It sounds like one of I just want to get that out of the way. I, just I don't want to have any case my mom is yeah. watching, she's on the record for having me reproduce and actually have <laughs> children. So, um, you're for reproduction. Yeah, I'm for then. reproduction okay. and you're right. for birth control. Right. This is a. <laughs> Uh, we can't Senator, agree on everything. We can't agree on everything. No, no, no. I think my mom would uh, uh, would be on my side. Uh, <laughs> yes, Senator Booker. It sounds like one of your favorite apps is Uber. What do you love about Uber? Look, I, I, I love the disruptive. You could get in trouble with this one. Go well, ahead. I think, uh, boy, yeah, I yeah, think about yeah, this no, one. I, have to, I love the disruptive force of technology. I love the fact that if you look through uh, America's history, this incredible country of innovation, uh, of of ideas, that we have constantly been putting. Uh, disruptive uh, technologies out there. And, and by the way, they've been often public-private partnerships. Uh, this company called Keyhole uh, that, what, that came about uh, from NASA technology that was then bought by somebody called Google that created Google Maps. It's a disruptive technology that Uber and other companies are now using to innovate in the second round. So I, I'm, I love the, the idea that we are finding ways to level the playing field, to give disadvantaged communities better access. In fact, these smartphones, if you look at apps like Twitter, for example, are more used in poor communities uh, because, these, uh, uh, because our smartphones have become such powerful access, uh, opportunities to access democracy. And when it comes to organizing, and I know Rand knows this, uh, the power now to connect with people across geography, race, religion, social status, and organize around common ideals, in some ways is making undermining political parties when those parties aren't aligned with uh, the issues of passion for communities. And I spoke to some young people last night, and I told them this. Every great social movement in our nation's history or in our globe, young people have been at the center of it. And they now have tools to get the issues out that we may not even be focused on as politicians, but you might be uh, and could help better lead. Because as I see it, and again, he's quoting history, and, and, and whether it's a civil rights movement or, or a civil rights legislation, change doesn't seem to come from Washington. It comes to Washington by the activism of others. And now they have tools uh, that uh, Martin Luther King and John Lewis and others didn't have. Senator Paul, when you joined Snapchat, in January, what did you tell people the reason was? Was it Snapchat or Tinder? Which one was it? I don't know. <laughs> Swipe right. It was funny when we joined it. I, you know, I'm. I sometimes think I'm clever. I'm not always, and I sometimes think I'm funny. So I, I put a picture of a full moon up there, and I said, "So there, NSA, you've been mooned." <laughs> all right, that's kind of corny. And then, then the kids all, then the kids all said, "That's not how you're supposed to use Snapchat. You're supposed to talk. You're supposed to do video." And so, uh, but we did kind of uh, sort of play on the fact that you're, it disappears. The NSA doesn't get a hold of it, which is probably not true. They can get stuff within a millisecond. So, um, but I like the concept of it. And it is a concept of privacy in the sense it's uh, short conversations. And it is a concept that uh, disappears, doesn't uh, type your memory. But also uh, there is an aspect of privacy. And I think privacy issue is probably, I think, the overwhelming issue of the last year and maybe of the next year that we have to figure out in an age where you've got people like Senator Booker who are tweeting all the time, he deserves to have, uh, oh, you don't have any privacy in your tweets, do you? They go everywhere. <laughs> but anyway, you do deserve to have privacy in your communications with people. And uh, the, the Supreme Court recently with that, with the 9-0 ruling saying that your cell phone can't be looked at with a warrant is a huge step forward and a huge blow uh, uh, forward for, for freedom. Senator Booker, you, as part of your campaign, you've been doing Run With Corey events. Tell us about those. Yeah, I, I just uh, I, I love uh, exercise and fitness, something I haven't been good at in these two campaigns. And so I was, I, was, I was eating my way through the entire state of New Jersey. I wanted to make sure I worked out. My campaign manager at the time who said, uh, believed that everything had to be on mission, uh, I decided, you know what, if I'm going to get a workout in then and, and comply with your on missionness, let me uh, run with a bunch of people. And they've been incredibly successful at some points having hundreds of people uh, go running with us. And at the time that we have epidemic obesity, uh, and a lot of ch health challenges that are preventable by, uh, through lifestyle choices, uh, 
I'm hoping that I can uh, really be the change I want to see in the world and continue to be out there running. Now, the New York Post made a little fun of you. Have you had results from Run With Corey? Um, you know, the, the Post tried to shame me by showing me my gross obesity uh, uh, highlighted. Uh, but the, the, the reality is, is, is uh, uh, that is one of my goals. You know, they ranked the top 10 most in shape, uh, uh, some uh, group, as senators. And uh, I, I just I told Thune before I came over here, John uh, Thune, who's, who's my, the best in shape. He probably he is. is. wasn't on the list. And I said, and I was, and I said that that's really uh, uh, the true, true uh, inadequacies of that list, and, and it, it renders it illegitimate. I got a lot of work to do, um, but my hope is uh, to again be the change I want to see. And what do you listen to while you're running with Corey? Uh, I'm, I have uh, maybe it remarks my politics of, of, of going across the field. I have the most eclectic taste. Uh, possible from gospel to uh, Bon Jovi, from uh, rap uh, to classic rock. Uh, I, and I even like, um, and this is going to be the headline tomorrow, I like show tunes too. Uh, um, uh, uh, um, you know, so, so I, I don't mind a little, you know, Les Mis. Um, uh, yes, so. Anne Hathaway has a phenomenal uh, version of on, on My Own. Have you heard it? <laughs> We're going to play that at the next uh, play of cocktails. We have to have another round of cocktails, I think, before we yeah. play but that. any Jersey guy who's running, you've got to have a little Bruce and Bon Jovi. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Senator Paul, you've traveled to 30 states in the last 12 months. Uh, you've been to three times to South Carolina. Uh, in August, you're going to be three days in Iowa. It sounds like you're laying the foundation to do a lot more in Iowa. <laughs> not, that any, not that anybody's counting, right? Um, you know, I am interested in uh, winning, our party winning, our party getting bigger. And while, you know, earlier we talked about it doesn't have to always be about Republican, Democrat, with, with race relations, we have done so terribly with, with affiliation that we do have to talk about it on our side. Uh, the vote in 1930 was 99%. African Americans voted Republican. Now it's 95% the other way. So we do have a lot of work and a lot of convincing to do. And so I will continue to try to take that message across the country that uh, you are welcome in our party, uh, no matter the color of the skin, your creed, religion, where you come from, whether you're poor, rich, or in between, that our party is going to be a bigger party. And we're going to talk about messages that can hopefully bring new people into our party. In a nation that has uh, more African Americans under criminal supervision, uh, than all the slaves in 1850, and a nation that uh, has uh, real issues where uh, many of the uh, folks I'm talking to are just looking for hope. Uh, I think that we all in Washington need to stop talking about partisanship and talking about substantive things that are going to improve the lives of Americans. And I'm very happy to say as our time runs out uh, that I'm glad to be in a Senate with people like Durbin and Leahy and Lee and, and Rand that are willing to focus on an issue uh, that is so critical. Uh, to the success of our nation, for us living up to who we say we are, which is a land of the free. Uh, and, and we have a lot of work to do, but I'm hoping uh, as we work on this issue, and I know the president is concerned. In fact, the president, when he talked about Brothers Keepers, called out Mike Lee um, as one guy right. that's actually working on this issue. Uh, that if we can come together uh, and deal with the liberty uh, and the empowerment and the saving of tax dollars for all Americans, uh, then there is real hope, and I'm grateful that you're working with me on this, Rand. Absolutely. So, Senator, Paul, Senator Paul, we've been talking uh, today it's about some of the unusual issues that you've been embracing. You talk to Republicans, Democrats. They say that if a Rand Paul type of Republican were to run for president in 2016, they would break up the Republican coalition that there's been, uh, the sort of hawkish Republicans, Wall Street, that this different of a Republican would really tear things apart. Do you worry about that? Well, I've got news for them. The previous coalition isn't big enough to win. <laughs> you know, so I think the, the frankly, a plurality of Americans now are no longer Republican or Democrat. So they are looking for some of the good aspects of the Democrat Party and some of the good aspects of the Republican Party. And I frankly think that someone who comes forward and who transforms these issues and gets on the other side of some of these issues, I think there could be a, a huge realignment. Young people aren't so wedded to party so much. Corey mentioned that. Um, I think that uh, you go out to California and Silicon Valley, they're more conservative than the president on fiscal issues, but they're more moderate than Republicans on social issues. They don't fit neatly in a box out there. So there's a lot of people, I think, who are searching for something new. If something's news presented, I don't worry that it'll disrupt some paradigm. The paradigm, the coalition, it's not big enough now, so something's going to happen. 
I need to post a selfie with him. I'm trying to get my... Uh, <laughs> can, I, can I do that as we close? Please do. Okay, good, uh, very much so. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we're not done. We're going to be done in just a second. Oh, okay. Uh, we've hugged, quick, we've hugged, shook hands. And we're about, to, we're about to get the hell out of there. We're about to get the Hercule shake hands one more time. Uh, uh, if, all politics is local. If we have gotten through this bill, uh, he promised me he's going to shave his head if we get this thing passed. <laughs> 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 Now that would be dishonest of you to say. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one quick goodbye question for each of you. First, Senator Booker, yes. all politics is local. What's going to become of your governor? Um, he's going to continue to govern. Uh, <laughs> he's a governor of the state of New Jersey, and, and I'm not sure what his uh, next steps are going to be. I'm sure we're all waiting to find out. But right now, uh, New Jersey has a lot of challenges, and our governor needs to be in the saddle uh, dealing with them. That seems to be uh, every day what he's doing. And I, I talk to him a lot. We exchanged uh, some text messages last night on a New Jersey issue facing a lot of our constituents. So again, it's a chance for me to work across party aisles to try to help uh, our state, and, and I appreciate that spirit from him. Vandy Fair in the August issue has a long article about it called Christie Land. Do you have concerns about what goes on in Christie Land? Um, I, I, I cannot say that I've ever visited Christie Land. <laughs> uh, I visit Jersey from Cape May to uh, Bergen County, and uh, we are a great state uh, that has a lot of love for uh, uh, for the, the the people that we that we lead that lead us, and and it says a lot about New Jersey that we are willing to elect Republicans and Democrats. I'm just proud to be from the state. But do you have any concerns about what goes on in that office? I, I, I honestly don't know what you're referring to, um, <laughs> but uh, I, I visited the office before, so maybe I've been to Christie Land. Look, we have so much, uh, it's almost, our politics ha have almost become uh, uh, this purient spectator sport. Democracy is not a spectator sport. It is, it necessitates and demands the engagement of citizenry. And if we get caught up in, in things that are just not central. Right now in America, he, you heard it from Rand Paul, there are people in prison for nonviolent offenses that don't need to be there, that have uh, a drug addictions, they need treatment, that have mental health challenges, uh, they need medical support. We are spending so much money, wasting dollars. These are the issues that actually could help our economy fund better. In fact, just by reducing recidivism 10%, uh, uh, we could have tens of millions of dollars that we could be investing in making college more affordable in our infrastructure. The, the first conversation I had when I visited Rennan's office, and, and this is where I really appreciate it, we talked about balance sheet issues. Where can government stop spending and actually create more investment in things that actually return an investment and grow our economy? As I look at, analyze our, our, our spending as a nation, our tax dollar spending, we're spending less and less on those things that produce a return on investment, infrastructure, research, and we're spending more and more on those things that don't produce a return, like our criminal justice system. It doesn't have to be that way. Senator Paul, as we say goodbye uh, out in the hall there, you told me about a very re important recruiting move that Republicans had made. Yeah, we've been getting our butts kicked in the baseball game by the Democrats for the last four years. They have this young congressman, it's really unfair, he's under 40 years old, which makes him extraordinary, and he played baseball in college. So we now have a Republican recruit, I'm happy to announce. I'm afraid. Who won the primary in North Carolina in a Republican seat, and he played college baseball. So we got it. We are, we are ready for the Democrats next year. Well, I, I'm hoping as a former football player I, that maybe we can do a, a, a tackle football game. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I hold any, uh, any uh, violent intentions, but it would be a really fun thing to do we for the Senate. We let football players play. Steve <laughs> Largent played. He was our pitcher for eight years, and we won eight years in a row with Steve really? Largent. Yeah. Uh, really? I, I can imagine the slide into home base would be a fun uh, impact uh, aspect. Yeah. Um, but no, the, the, uh, the, the, this is a hotly contested thing I've learned is the, is the, is the baseball game. Now I'm really worried. And we're bitter over the losses. <laughs> so we are, we are coming back for blood. I, I, listen, I'm hoping that instead uh, we could host Festivus this year. And when it comes time for, when it comes time for feats, of, feats strength, of strength, that we yeah. can then have a competition maybe judged by a political audience to see who has the best feet of strength. Right. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we want to thank our colleagues here at the museum who made this event possible, the staffs of Senator Paul and Senator Booker, the amazing Portico event staff, all of our friends out in live stream land who are watching. We thank the Bank of America for making this possible, you for coming out, and senators, thank you for a fantastic conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was fun.